Hey everyone, this is Philip from Hail Reaper. Wanted to give a quick thank you and shout out to anyone that's here listening for the very first time. My two closest friends, Jeremy, Mathar, and I have been making this show for just a little under a year. And we love creating for the world of Red Rising and its amazing fan base. Today's episode was a little different than normal. We had Pierce Brown, the author and creator of the Red Rising saga on with us, but it still carries a lot of the same familiar energy that we bring to each and every episode of Hail Reaper. Wanted to also give a shout out to Janelle, our strawberry sovereign. You're going to hear her voice on this episode today, and she was wildly instrumental in getting this episode to happen. She is also our social media handler and our project manager. She does so much for us, and we are so thankful for her. Last but not least, a spoiler tag. Books one through five are on the table, so be warned. Thanks so much, and enjoy the episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Hail Reaper. My name is Philip, and this is my good friend, Jeremy. What's going on, dude? This is my good friend, Mathar. Hello, Philip. And then also, this is my new friend, author and creator of the Red Rising Saga, Pierce Brown. How's it going, Pierce? God, I sound really cool when you say it like that. Um, (laughs) What's up, man? Thanks for having me on. Thank you for coming on. This is a treat. Uh, My pleasure. I, I, you know, perused a couple of your guys' episodes, and I love the production values, and some of the stuff gave me tingles on the arms, like the intro. I love that. And then I think there was a tag on one of the episodes that uh, Janelle forwarded me, which was like a really nice. good uh, rendition. Which which episode was that, Janelle? I'm not sure. I think it might have been either the Tactus Eulogy or Aries. The Tactus Eulogy. Oh, I got yeah. all like, you know, emotional and shit. That's yeah. the favorite. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a great moment. Thanks for checking that out. I would have never guessed you would have listened to anything we've done, honestly. So that's cool. You know, you have to stay away from their views and all that shit. So, but sometimes like someone sends you something, you're like, I'll click it. And then I was like driving along and I listened to like three episodes. And I, and I think there was some negative talk. And I'm, I'm going to re-listen and find out which one of you it was. <laughs> I actually have something to get to right off the top. This is pressing information. I know that you wrote Desert Sun. You're a big Star Wars fan. I've heard you talk about it many times. Oh, gosh, yeah. And this is a conversation I've always wanted to have with you. And it's, we all love Star Wars. We all grew up on Star Wars. And I know I'm going to guess that we all have the same favorite movie. So let's talk about Attack of the Clones for a little while. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the sand gets everywhere. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Uh, that's maybe my least favorite movie of all time. I'm not even joking. I just, I can't. It's up there, man. Well, have you seen Bats with a Z? Uh, oh, no. I have no. not seen Bats with a Z. That would be your least favorite movie of all time. I rented it <laughs> a blockbuster. I wasted my hard R. We were allowed to get PG-13 only, and I wasted my R movie on Bats with a Z. <laughs> Can you tell us okay. what happens in Bats with a Z real yeah, quick? Give us like the, the elevator pitch. Uh, yeah. There's bats. <laughs> okay. But with a Z. <laughs> Use your imagination. Are they, are they it's angry? honestly that. It's like it's like <laughs> yeah, even even when I was ten years old, I remember them shooting backwards with a nine millimeter at this like, you know, horde of bats. And there's like if you have like a ratio of one bullet to a thousand bats, <laughs> you're not making a dent. So it's like, what are you shooting at? You know. It, it, but New Red Rising came about from basically me disagreeing with things. So, you know, this yeah, is yeah. a bat. Maybe I'll do my own bats next time. We'll figure it out. There's not a bat in Tinos that we ever see, I don't believe. So, I'm sure I'll you were like bats this. bats in Dark Age. Yeah, well, actually true. The yeah, milk I forgot that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah creepy little gross okay, guys. Okay, so you brought yeah. in that inspiration and just put it into yeah, your I did. Yeah. I did. Thank you, Mom, for letting me <laughs> rent bats. <laughs> we uh we goof on stuff like we goof on Lost, we goof on some Star Wars stuff, but I oh, I'm wanting to see bats now. Just based off of this very brief <sighs> conversation, I gotta check it out. We'll do a bats podcast and Pierce can be a co host. Oh dude, Pierce, It'll would you yeah, fantastic. you should come back for a bats one. Think about the sound <laughs> effects you'd get to use. It'd be, be the worst w- podcast ever created. Would it be? <laughs> or would it be the best? You know, it could be the Dogecoin of podcasts. Touche. Touche. <laughs> this could be something. We're onto it there. Pierce, we have a segment that we do like to do. Basically, we, we have a Discord community. Mm. It's centered around Red Rising. We just It's like all of your super fans and like one little place online that uh, that also listen to our podcast. And we have one homie in there. Uh, his howler name is Fractal. And each week, he gives us this really amazing question to chew on. And it's like always centered around uh, your universe. And the question he asked this week, I thought was a really good one. And I'd love to hear your answer to this because I think you can have a really interesting one. Okay. Is that, um, so here's the set up for it you're a rich silver gold or a duke or duchess of the syndicate or perhaps you're a famous warlord 
Either way, you have a collection of prized relics that you've bought, earned, or stolen. It can be razors, paintings, sculptures, or artifacts. What is your ultimate prized possession? You know, this kind of, I guess, uh, goes parallel well with the discussion I always have with my friends. Is like, you know, why would you ever want to be a gold? Wouldn't you want to be a silver and just not be in the power games? So I'd stay away from razors. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. you just don't want it. You, you never know when like an ancestor of Akari is going to show up and just gut your security team. And that, you know, be a waste of money and all of the healthcare payments that I'd have to make, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, we put money into that fund for a reason, but I don't necessarily want to go through it in one day when an Akari relative comes and destroys everyone. So I think I'd go with paintings. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, carved creatures. I would have Ooh, there you a... Go. Oh, good answer. Yeah, yeah. I'd have a menagerie. A collector. I'd have a menagerie of carved <laughs> creatures. It's like um, Aladdin. That are... Yeah, yeah. They're like the most esoteric creatures ever created. So it's the things that make griffins look like run-of-the-mill puppies. And that would be very cool. That's some... Boozy ass shit, dude. That's the shit. most boozy <laughs> answer. I love it. And, <laughs> and if, like, if I was writing that in, of course, there would be that character who would be having his dinner party and he'd be bragging about his items oh, yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And then one of the creatures from his menagerie would, uh, you know, smell the blood on someone's finger when they cut oh, their uh, hummingbird eggs the wrong way and then would descend and kill the dinner party. Yeah. How yeah, small yeah, are the hummingbird yeah, yeah. eggs? Like, they could be like, they've got to be like, they're really super small. Micro- yeah, really small, huh? Yeah. So easy to cut them the wrong way. <laughs> yeah. I have like a mental image of Lilith eating hummingbird eggs in the grossest way possible. And I just, I can't knock it out of I my head. I love that. I love that. No, and, and <laughs> you know, she's a character that doesn't respect life. So I thought, what's, you know, the kind of the most fragile life that we can uh, sympathize mm. with? And so hummingbird eggs. God. And it's so, so eccentric. Callous. It's so it's so, <laughs> so great. You're, you're the John Hammond, uh, the most <laughs> lovable villain of your own universe. It's perfect. I mean, for a long time, for you have no idea how many drafts I did trying to find a moment where there were hummingbird eggs left on a table, and someone pieced together who the queen of the syndicate was based off that. And I, you know, Dang. it just didn't work out that way because. But I was like trying to work it in so much, just because, <laughs> well, just for the, the the about that ten percent of the readers that would catch that. But it just didn't work because I, I had to uh, press down Mustang's sections mm. in order to uh, really expand some of the martial stuff you see in Dark Age. Otherwise, it would have been 1,200 pages. So, yeah. we didn't get the if noir Mustang, detective I, I, mystery. I would allow it. Yeah, well, maybe you might get uh, you might get <laughs> excerpts from this, this next book because like just uh, the parallel timeline stuff, you know, because there's so much that goes uh, sometimes uh, down on the page that doesn't get into the book. And I think like now we're in a universe where you can share that kind of stuff you know mm-hmm. i think that people are more accepting of that and then if you if you saw like the the rough drafts of star wars for instance like there wasn't like an accepting community to look at that now but it'd be kind of funny to see some of the chapters i've written that don't end up making it into the next book so i'm thinking about like figuring a way to maybe edit them or not it's the problem is it's basically how much behind the curtain do you want to show some thoughts? yeah how about a shit escalates coffee book table with the extra excerpts love that Genius. Oh my gosh. That would, that would come be so staff, wicked. Jerry? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> I mean, Let's make hey, this happen. Yeah. Janelle will draft up the contract. Janelle's yeah. making notes. <laughs> She's already making the business plan. The problem is I need someone to make the business plan. Like, I'm like one of those guys that one of those annoying friends that always says, I have the next billion dollar idea, but then does nothing with it. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. wouldn't it be great if you could pay people, you know, online, PayPal? <laughs> but like, could I do that? No. <laughs> I want, I want to get back to Jeremy. Jeremy, what's your answer to the same question? All right. So I was thinking about it. You threw a couple things out at me, but I think what's stuck in my mind. Don't steal my answer. I'm not going to steal okay, your answer. I don't worry. Sure. Uh, I don't know what your answer is, but I'm going to try not to steal it. So I actually, I love the Beatles. I love just 60s music and and where the recording was going. I love the recording process, as, as you can see from, from the podcast. I don't want a replica of Abbey Rhodes, I actually want Abbey Rhodes, like okay. in its original form in the 60s, like all the equipment, <laughs> everything brought in. I want actual Abbey Rhodes reconstructed for me. Oh my God. Because I am a silver and that's, I, I would get it. I just buy yeah. it. Okay. So there's my answer. That is insane, but I'm yeah, you just kidnap Mickey, kidnap Mickey and it'll make you Abbey Rhodes, all the stuff. There we go. Sweet. Let's do it. Deal. So <laughs> speaking of uh, Attack of the Clones, 
Uh, one of my favorite things, oh, no. one of my favorite characters close. from that movie <laughs> is Speed. I'm going to bring yeah. back. This is this yeah. is a thread. Watch. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to bring it back to General Grievous and the collection of lightsabers. Like that's going to be my thing. I'm going to like hunt down and kill golds for like, or I'm going to pay people who like hunt down and kill golds for their razors, and I'm going to have like a giant collection of razors that have come from fallen golds, and cool. uh, that'll be my very bougie secret. That should be a character. Yeah, that's great. I mean, yeah, I just got, I got beat. That's just great. call me after we'll talk. It's a yeah, high piece yeah, of yeah. Time, so. Break it down for <laughs> me, yeah. A follow up on that, Mathar. Is there one specific razor from uh, maybe a fallen uh, soldier that you would like, I, I got to have that one. I want that one in this collection. Oh, you mean who's my Obi-Wan? Yeah. Okay, spoiler alert for <laughs> anybody who doesn't know. Um, who's my Obi-Wan? Well, I, if I'm like kind of a general grievous, then... I don't know. Maybe I'm like a descendant of, maybe I'm a descendant of Ragnar's. And so it would be like the descendant of like, a, a, like a Grimace, maybe. I don't know. I could see Valdir Unshorn getting a little oh, unhinged dude. and going yeah, into yeah, that. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, one of the things that the Obsidians do, uh, I don't know if I actually made it into the last book, but in this next book, they fuse the uh, sigils of the golds they kill onto their armor. And so, what? like, the, yeah. So the so the ones that uh, have done well, uh, they literally glow. You know, especially when they are. Uh, so oh my god! Imagine this this line of obsidian aerial infantry coming at you, and some of them are sparkling, <laughs> and that's because the gold <laughs> that they've taken from like people they've like scalped and killed. You um, can't omit that. That's not going on the end of the floor. You're onto, you're onto like I a obviously inferred here. all of that from <laughs> subtext, which is why I, yeah, Perfect. totally, totally Perfect. intended for all of that to come Well out. done, yeah. Mathar. Mathar, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Unlocking. Great podcasters. Yeah. You guys are killer. <laughs> Mathar is the key master. Yeah. Um, that, that answer kind of almost made me cry, Pierce. I'm not going to lie. I was kind of, I almost wanted to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Philip, what about you? Um, I'm, I don't like owning a lot of things. I have, Pierce, I have two young children, so everything I own is going to get destroyed. So I've never had a, a reason to uh, be able to own something nice. Like, this is why I can't have nice things. Sure. But if I'm that rich, I guess I have a room that I can put them in. Uh, I like, I, I would You might have want a planet to... from moon. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so you're going to put your children yeah. in I'm a going, room? I'm going just, to, yeah. <laughs> no, I thought you were going to say, I guess I would have a room for my things, but I thought no, you no, said, a room for my a room, yeah, yeah. A room for my I could collection. put my children in. <laughs> you have this fantastic vault for your children. Yeah, yeah so you can put my things in the rest of the house. Like. Lock them away, forget about it. Just lock them in with textbooks that come out as autodidacts. Yeah. It'll be great. Oh my gosh. Perfect. It's it's basically a Scrooge McDuck vault, but with no money in it. That's where they go. Just um, children instead of no. money. Yeah, no, no. Well, so couldn't you see Nero? Couldn't you see Nero doing that? Like at age six, <laughs> yeah, Nero yeah. would go to like Mustang and Adrius and be like, "Here's your education." And he locks them in a vault for two years and <laughs> makes them read all the books. And you get out when you read all yeah. the books. <laughs> An escape yeah. room is his education. Sibling bonding. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I can see. I can see Adrius doing it in a lot faster uh, time. Puzzle your way out of this one, weirdo. <laughs> Um, okay, Mathur, to answer the question, I'm sorry. Uh, I want to go and get like a bunch of vintage, like old vintage Fender bass guitars and like just Telecasters and Stratocasters and just have like old 1960s. Like, I'm going to steal one of the guitars from Abbey Rhodes, by okay. the way. I'm I'll just going to take one. Yeah, I'm just going to take one. Yeah, um, one. But like specifically like old bass legends like uh, James Jamerson and mm. like, uh, you know, I'll get like the violin bass, like I'll, which is not Fender, but Paul McCartney's uh, violin bass. I'm just going to go like full on sick bass collection from the 60s. <laughs> and, so that's my that's what I'd want. Love it. Yeah. Does it sound terrible? What's up? It sounds so bad. <laughs> it sounds so bad. Mather, I'm glad we stayed in universe. These cats can have their guitars what? and shit. What? No, don't worry about Mather, it. Mather, no, jump no, it's cool, on my man. We know who the real <laughs> fans are. We know who the real oh. fans are. It's chill. <laughs> we routed. Oh. oh, man. I failed the test. Welcome to my new podcast. Mathar and Pierce are the new hosts of uh, yeah. Hail Reaver. Okay, well, we'll see you guys later. <laughs> We're resigning. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Great. <laughs> Nothing will get done. It'll just be rabbit holes, rabbit holes. It will, it will. <laughs> it's truly, <laughs> no one will come with a plan. No. It'll just oh, it also, it'll oh, never okay. get published. Like, no one will ever see the thing. True. We'll just have videos for ourselves, Mather. It's, you're completely right, actually. If I didn't have Jeremy, I wouldn't get anything done. So That's my yeah. personality, too. Great. Yeah, dude. There we go. We're the fun ones. 
Yeah, Mather, I'm coming back to you on this though. Like later, <laughs> later today, I'm coming back to you on this for saying my idea was boring. So I don't know how. I didn't say. That. Yeah, you, you, I you implied tr- your idea was boring. You the one who said it. Technically, you implied. Yeah, it. Yeah, that's trashed true. on that's it. True. I said it. Yeah. I thought your room for your children was really cool. That seemed way more like a gold. Like Pierce can make fun of me. Pierce is the guest. He's allowed to make fun of me. So you're you're supposed to be like one of my best friends. This is this doesn't work. So <laughs> I might not get invited back, you know, but yeah. um that's No, I, yeah. Come back whenever you like. Uh shout out to Fractal for that question. If you wanna throw us an answer, you can find it on Twitter or Instagram or you can join the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Hellreaper and get involved in all of our community happenings. We're going to go ahead and take a quick break, but when we come back, we're talking about one of our favorite scenes from the first trilogy. See you in a second. Hail Reaper is brought to you this week by Tariqin Law. If you're seeking legal counsel or you're in a situation that you're not sure how to handle, Tariqin Law might just be the answer. They offer a free consultation to assess your situation because not every attorney is the right professional for the job. The great thing about Tariqin Law is that there's no double speak, no confusing language. No upfront commitment. It's just a conversation with someone who wants to understand what you're going through and help you get to the next step. Getting started is easy. Just call 559-627-5399 or visit tarigianlaw.com on the whole net. That's T-O-R-I-G-I-A-N-L-A-W.com. No matter the circumstance, we all deserve peace of mind. So stop sitting with the uncertainty and get the advice you need today. Once again, that's T O R I G I. A-N-L-A-W.com or call 559-627-5399. Tarikian Law. The advice you need, minus the BS. One of the biggest things we like to do on Hail Reaper, and we like to talk about scenes, moments, just really dive into them. We're not necessarily trying to be critics. We're not necessarily trying to be authority figures. We know we're not. We have the authority figure with us today. Jeremy, you and I just like to share how we feel about these moments. Like, because they these books yeah. mean so much to us. The story means so much to us. And I've cried multiple times on this podcast, just talking about Tactus, talking about uh, Ragnar, talking about these characters that mean, like, mean so much to me. Uh, no one ever sees that, Pierce, because uh, we usually don't do video, but still, I, I cry. So well, I'm glad we'll be able to see it today. Yeah, you can see it today. There you yeah, go. There I hope we do. I hope we do. hope the resolution's good. <laughs> um, there's a moment in this story that I've been wanting to talk to you about, honestly, since I read this story back in 2017 when I, when I picked up Morningstar and I, I got to uh, a chapter that is just like, it almost haunts me in, in a good way. Like, I just want to think about it. I just kind of chew on it all the time. The chapter's called Colossus. The chapter starts off with Darrow mourning the loss of his friend Roke. Then quickly, he turns at the docks Ganymede. In his words, he's winning the next war. When I reach the sparkling gem that is Ganymede, I bring the Colossus parallel to the monument of industry they've built in orbit at her equator. I'm under no delusion. I know who will die when we fire. I turn to the helmsman about to give the order when Victor puts a hand on my shoulder. Share the load, darling. This one's on me. Helmsman! Open fire with all port batteries. Launch to 21 through 50 at this distance. Together, we stand shoulder to shoulder and watch the warship lay ruin to the defenseless dock. Sefi stares out in profound awe. She has watched the hollows of ship warfare. But her war until now has been narrow holes in men in gunfire. 
This is the first time they see what a vessel of war can do. And for the first time, I see her frightened. It's a crime that the Marvel should die like this. No song, nothing but silence, and the unblinking gaze of the stars to herald the end of one of the great monuments of the Golden Age. And I hear in the back of my mind that age-old truth of darkness whispering to me. Death begets death begets death. The moment is sadder than I wanted. So I turn to Sefi as the dock continues to fall apart. The shattered bits drifting down to the moon, where they will fall into the sea or upon the cities of Ganymede. The ship must be renamed. I would like you to choose. Tir Morga. It means morning star. This part of the story has massive ramifications for the present and also for the future of your story, Pierce. I know through our email correspondence, you said that this is one of your favorite moments. And I was actually blown away that you you stated that. Um, so I actually want to start there and then we'll get kind of, we can start like kind of broad and then kind of zero in on some specifics. But why would you consider this one of your favorite moments of your story? I suppose it's because I remember exactly what I was channeling when I created the moment. Uh, I was remembering a World War II book that I'd read, um, mm. which had talked about Patton's urge to press the war all the way to Moscow. And there was a big push in um, 1945 and 44 to use the atomic weapons, you know, to scare the Soviets, but then also to do a, uh, basically to continue the Western Front all the way to the gates of Moscow. And Patton was urging that we needed to win the next war before the first one ended. Mm. And often a lot of the wars in history have been started by people trying to predict the future and trying to establish the momentum or I guess maintain the momentum that they've gotten in one war, mostly because it's so hard for societies in Europe for war. And, you know, with the tension over, hanging over your head, why not do it when there's a vulnerability in the enemy? And I thought it spoke a lot to the blood begets blood begets blood that Lorne mm -hmm. Aoarcos uh, taught Darrow or told Darrow, and which is a recurring theme throughout the series. So in many ways, it is Darrow accepting uh, Darrow's accepting a world where war is his future. I think, and it is a tactical decision that I think is consistent with his character throughout, but is perhaps also a flaw in his character, particularly considering the events that I knew were going to unfold in Iron Gold and in Dark Age and thereon. And it seemed to me a great moment to take characters like Romulus and the, the, the Ra family are very uh, easy to like compared to, I think, the other golds. And mm -hmm. when Darrow violates the trust that he has with them, it violates a little bit more the reader's perspective of Darrow, particularly with the look of the casualties that are um, created during the event. But that speaks in a lot of ways to what I think Darrow is. You know, Darrow, I created the character simply because I'd watched too many films and read too many books where the hero had won and then turned his back on the villain, only for the villain to lunge up and try to stab him and then mm -hmm. the hero to bat his blade away and then kill the villain. So you get the emotional satisfaction of killing the villain without the, or the catharsis really, uh, without the uh, moral weight uh, being thrust on the hero. And you see that all the time in Bond films. And I think that's kind of a cop-out. And that's one of the reasons I created Darrow, who is a character that makes decisions which th he doesn't run away from the moral ramifications of his decisions. They, they yeah. do fall on him and sometimes also fall on him in you know, a real-world way beyond just the realm of morals. And I wanted to see that in a character. So it's exactly who Darrow is always. It's, you know, um, those moments of mercy that he also has, which come back to bite him in the ass. So he always has to make a... You know, quick calculation. Is it worth it? And for me, that was an important uh, moment for him to kind of decide who he was in the future, if that makes sense. No, I think it, it totally makes sense. I, I think as a follow-up, I see this, I guess, as the first time 
we really see Darrow kind of rationalizing a really questionable act. There's definitely things he's done. You know, he's not perfect by any means, but this one could really be viewed uh, two completely different ways. But I know in interviews and in the past, you've talked about Darrow as an unreliable narrator in a sense. Mm. So I'm wondering if like, is this the first time he's really rationalized something or has he actually done it in the past, but we're just getting like the the good side of it. We're not actually seeing that that discourse in, inside of him. I think it may be the first time that we see him rationalize something on this scale. Um, we see it again, you know, in the, uh, the, the Battle of Mercury, and he decides to do something different than he's done in the past, which signals a character growth with not, you know, amping up the storm gods to such a level mm-hmm. that they create the catastrophe that would win him the battle. Mm-hmm. But I think it's the first time that it really crystallizes in a moment in the series, because every other kill up until then is pretty much a uh, decision. Well, it's pretty much limited to individuals, isn't it? Yeah, uh, because when I think some of the only like real kills he's done without mercy are with maybe with Vixus in the elevator. Yeah, um, the passage, um, and that might be it. Yeah, I think that's it. Otherwise, so I think it's a moment to really crystallize his growth and then uh, him taking on the moral weight of who he is or what he is, um, instead of having him just you know skim through this rebellion without really taking on a questionable act of of such scale. I struggle as a Daryl fan, like a huge Daryl fan, like the podcast being named after him, like kind of like just the, the lies, like wiping the blood off the knee, putting on his face, going in the hall display, changing the pattern of his breath and just like saying, you know, like, oh, hey, Romulus, like I'm still pressing for the bridge. I'm not even there yet. It's just, it's a weird look for a character that I, I love so much, but at the same time, I feel like it, I've heard you say this. Um, I love this, by the way. You said that like Darrow is part uh, Gryffindor and part Slytherin mm-hmm. <laughs> to go to, to Harry Potter world. Yeah. And I, I think that's really important to have that dichotomy and to, and to show that. Very accurate. And this is the one time that you get this moment where it's just like, he could be seen as a villain. Is this the first time? I love what you're saying and I think you're 100% right. But I think I wrote that moment for uh, readers like you. Readers who had excused Darrow's earlier duplicity because he's Mm -hmm. been slithering through a big chunk of Golden Sun. Think about how he treats Mustang. Think about how he treats all of his friends. Think about what he does to Roke before, you know, he does the Civil War instigation at the uh, the gala. Darrow has always, I mean, he's he's an infiltrator. He's a slave who's pretending to be one of the masters. And what affinity would he have for anyone in the Rim? This is the first time there. So I think in many ways, the moment exists in order to make that question, because I hope it when you would reread like the first and second book, that you would see him in a different light in some of his moral acts that he does or doesn't do and see a bit more of that darkness existing within him. Because I think it's always been there just on a smaller level. Mm -hmm. The Morning Star is about power. You know, it's like what happens when you finally have the power. And Darrow meets out his justice in a way that's, you know, I'm, I'm glad you put it out as uh, he was thinking about it in a calculating way, which is then echoed by the Ash Lord later on, a rational transaction for Rhea, right? And the gold thought it was a rational transaction to neuter all of mankind. So it's part of Darrow's kind of like understanding as, you know, as he gets more power, it's not about individuals, it's about the hundreds of thousands, right? But at the same time, he's still doing what he's always done. Mm-hmm. You know, and in many ways, he's not he's not actually doing anything worse than he's done because he, now he's not like, you know, tricking and uh, confusing and betraying uh, main characters like Virginia or maybe a Cassius, you know, with uh, the Julian scenario. Um, so I think a lot of it has to do with the emotional attachment you have on to certain uh, aspects of him because you probably thought that Darrow is almost like it goes against the dream of EO what he's doing. Right. So he wouldn't do yes. it. Mm-hmm. But. Darrow's a guy that accepted early on he's a good man that's gonna have to do bad things and so I think that's how he justifies it (laughs) I actually like really appreciate this because it seems like what you're saying too is that you're not so concerned with people's uh vantage point on what who Darrow is like you just want you want people to be able to like interpret that themselves I want people to look at it yeah yeah I, I interpret it one way and then I'm sure other readers are interpreting it a completely different way and I I actually really appreciate it because I think a lot of creators and authors are so protective of their main protagonist and they're trying to like kind of coddle the audience to make sure that they still like them and then make a 
boring ass main protagonist because of it i think <laughs> it happens all the <laughs> time do. though it does and it's just that moment i told you you know is is that the villain laying there on the floor and then has to stab the hero at the end and the hero gets to kill him that's bullshit because there's no choice there <laughs> and everything exists in a story to give a hero a choice and that choice reflects their growth and you get to see how darrow's mm. changed you know would he have done that in the first book no you know i don't think so but by the third book, I just spent I spent a little time on the message boards back then. I don't do it anymore. Um, and I saw the kind of the argument between Darrow being good or bad. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was like, fuck, let's just like throw a bone to the bad people because it is true that a lot of things Darrow does is like sociopathic early on. And I feel like a lot of readers didn't challenge it because it was okay because he hated the characters he was doing it to. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, let's give characters to do it to who, who it's not okay to do it to. Yeah. Um, and see if they ring, say the same message. And that, that conflict you're feeling is exactly why the scene exists. And that, and you made us like Romulus. You created this like cool, like, and Seraphina's there and it's just like chill. Yeah. It's like, hey, let's have a peach or a nectarine or whatever it was. I can't remember now. And like, <laughs> yeah. let's kick it. And then, um, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh man, like, uh, no, he's going to freaking like rail that dude's whole infrastructure of his society. It's like, oh, like, oh, that's that's because honor that's is not turn. what you say. It's what you do. Yeah. And when you read this next book, you'll see why it all happened. Nice. We're uh, we've been really jammed, by the way, that Romulus quote. Like, Which one? Math are jam the, the honor is not what you say, what you do. It's like, you know, it's the idea of like, it's not what about what you read. It's not what you it's it's mm. all what you do when he says that to Roke. Because everything you read, everything you say is just, you know. Like the culmination of you is in what you do, right? You know, it's like a sin isn't a, isn't a sin in Christianity unless you act on it. It's a mic drop from Romulus. It's probably one of the. I think it's maybe my favorite quote. Oh in that, fuck! Book. I love Romulus, man. I wish I didn't <laughs> have to kill him in Iron Gold. Yeah, but it just didn't work otherwise thematically. Uh, the Ragnar quote, like "I'm no builder," and then "Honor is not what you say; is what you do." Those just those moments. Mm. Oh my gosh! They kill. They just slay me. That's great. Uh, I mean, I'm gonna kill you in the face, Aja. Is also really fun. I'm that kill one you. I'm straight kill you in the up. Face. Is not mine. Mike Braff, my editor, put that one in and I kept it. And Serious? I thought it was so fucking funny. Yeah, because I just had several wake yeah. up doing the fuck. Yeah, yeah. And then my editor was like, go one <laughs> step further. And he threw a couple lines in there and I kept that one. That's, that's good. So good. Yeah. That was, that's all, that's a really good line. I mean, I had such a ball writing that scene. Yeah, it was great. Oh, man. The, the fan payoff for that too is, is so good because, like, I'm actually I'll, considering what we just talked about, like that chapter 49. I'm actually considering there's a fairly happy ending to Morningstar, I guess, in a way. Like, I'm always a little, every time I read it, I'm a little surprised oh, yeah. that it's kind of happy-ish. But I think that, I think I remember watching you on a video saying that this, that book was, it was for your fans. Like, you really wanted, like, some Morningstar? payoff. Yeah. And I think that, uh, I think that holds true. These, yeah, this new one's a little bit more for my uh, own intellectual curiosity. Of please, like, please. Because, you know, there's not many people likable by the end of dark age and the ones that are likable you know have been have not gotten the fitting ends they deserve and so it's yeah. like you know it's can the can a can a can a beautiful fragile idea survive all the maelstrom in between you know it's like you land it the plane it? however you want dude well, <laughs> land they, the plane however you want it, it, you know honestly in the end the series is about one thematic question is do you submit to fear and that's mm. what these that's Dang. what dark age is about that's what you know iron gold's about it's kind of like will you submit to fear and inconvenience you know is it worth it um for all the sacrifice required so that's what i'm figuring out in this last one so it's taking so long hmm. yeah that's cool take as long as you want yeah it's cool we're, we're patient <laughs> legs guys uh, yeah. Ho hopefully it won't be as long as uh, some cats but we'll figure it out yeah you talk about that evolution of, of darrow in a sense and it's like you know, even looking back at, at Golden Sun, I'm reminded of this situation where Karnas, you know, rams the ship into his. And he talks about hundreds upon hundreds of, of low colors dying. And he actually criticizes Karnas mm -hmm. and, and calls it just a game. But I, I mean, I personally, like, I'm not going to defend Karnas by any means. I'm not a Karnas fan. But in this one instance, what? I will. Because it's not just a game. Like, uh. Karnas is reconciling a blood feud. And to this society, that's so much bigger than a stupid game. Like, like he's risking his own life to try to take out Darrow in this moment. But it's funny how he sort of marginalizes that with Karnas on the individual level, but then gets put in a position where he's risking more lives. And he suddenly is okay with that. Like, like he makes that quote unquote quick calculation. Yeah. And part of that has to be human lives, right? Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And I think it's a case of Karnas knowing the rules quicker than Darrow did. Mm -hmm. You know, and over the course of Golden Sun, I think he gets taught the rules a bit more. Interesting. I like that. Um, That's cool. So any final thoughts on this scene, Jeremy? You want to throw anything out there? Oh man, I could go for a while, but we gotta <laughs> go we gotta it, call man. it quits sometime, right? Yeah, you can no take a swing. <laughs> yeah, I got some time. All right, I guess for me, when you said that you were re- uh, kind of channeling Patton, it really unlocked something. It, it made a lot of sense because that really is what we see Darrow in his development here, and it's. I guess once you said that, I, I sort of saw it as as a pivot point uh, in a sense, mm-hmm. because you have Darrow kind of originally right screwing up his relationships with with roke and and really just he just botches stuff up bad and he's continuing to learn and then like you put it you know this is the kind of the first time he has that that large army i mean even if you kind of look back at uh at golden sun when they're lying in the mud on the iron rain it's like he's lamenting the, this loss of gold life actually um to a great degree not the obsidians he brought with him yeah yeah and it's like but now He's taking the Colossus and like obsidians are piling up. Gray snipers from Roke are like picking them off and making piles out of them. And it's like, and he suddenly is like squaring himself with that and growing. A, or I guess you could like, right, it's different views, but you could say he's like growing as a person uh, and learning that these casualties are just a necessary part of it. And his understanding kind of has ramifications as a father and even as a husband in the second trilogy. One of my favorite historical figures is Ulysses S. Grant. But one of the things he was maligned for was the vast casualties that he was responsible for on the Union side. Except for Vicksburg, he basically used infantry columns like Napoleon did, which is as a sledgehammer. Napoleon was also very good at doing this because of the patriotism that existed in France at the time, as opposed to fighting the conscripts of Prussia or the people who were tricked into service in the small army of England. They had more men, so they'd use them like a hammer, and Darrow's the same way. Both of them were victorious in their own ways, but for Darrow, it was really like, how do I give him a bad way of winning to create tension down the line, and that would create seeds that the causation is realistic in-world, as well as being a reflection of Darrow's overall journey. It's a pivot for the man who goes into 10 years of war. And it's because he started taking on the mental arithmetic of the Ash Lord. That can be a rational transaction. And there's that warning from Lorne in Golden Sun. You're becoming one of them, a killer. Lorne didn't know why. Mustang never knew why until a certain moment, why Daryl was so driven. But Just because why he's driven is for a good cause doesn't mean he's any less of a bastard. Good bastards and bad bastards are just judged by who won. I only want to tell an interesting story. For me, it's the tragedy of Darrow in many ways. But I think a lot of the fun tragedies in the world are based on success. Hail Reaper. Hail Reaper. Hail Reaper.
Oh, I mean.